The After Show with Telecom TV's Guy Daniels and Ray LaMaitre. Hello and welcome to The After Show on Telecom TV. I'm Guy Daniels, Director of Content. and We're broadcasting live and waiting to hear from you at the end of day two of our Spotlight on 5G Week. It's been another busy day. We've just finished the Oran Alliance Industry Summit, so allow us to help you unwind with our little soiree. We've got a great lineup of guests joining us again today who are going to answer your questions. And if you haven't got in touch yet and want to do so, then please do now. Don't leave it too late. There's a form on the website below this video. And as always, the after show is co-hosted by Ray Lemaitre, Editorial Director at Telecom TV. Hello, Ray. And as I mentioned, it's been a busy and very, very long day so far with an early start to launch our new news program, The Slice, the second edition of which went out this morning. MWC is happening this week, mainly virtually. What's been your main highlights from the day? Uh, well, Guy, I mean, how much time do we have? I mean, uh, just here on Telecom TV, we've had two CTO interviews, one with Rakuten Mobile's Tarek Amin and one with Brendan O'Reilly from neutral host BAI, where he talked about the major 5G subway train network that BAI is building in the London Underground Network. And we had a great RAN roundtable panel and, of course, lots of hot industry news in today's episode of The Slice, some of which, of course, came from the MWC show floor. We just need the days to be longer, that's all. Yeah, you're not wrong there. As you say, we started the day with our Strategy Outlook program, which today focused on 5G RAN, and I'm sure we'll be receiving a number of questions around this topic. But on with the show, and joining us live on the program today are Arno Vampiris, who is Senior Vice President, Radio Networks and 5G Champion at Orange, Jose Antonio Aranda, Innovation and Product Strategy Director with Cellnex, Phil Mottram, President, Intelligent Edge, for Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Caroline Chan, VP and GM, 5G Infrastructure Division, Network Platform Group at Intel, and Tom Walker, Manager, Consulting Systems, Engineering, Telco, and 5G with Fortinet. Hello, everyone. Really good to see you all again. Now, we've got questions from our viewers to get through, as well as some of our own today. Plus, we've got a few surprises along the way. But first, it's MWC week, and some of us, at least, are not in Barcelona. Yes, things are rather different this year, and we find ourselves reporting on the event remotely. Uh, Telecom TV has a long history supporting the event, going back to 2002. But can you remember your first MWC? Well, let's ask our guests. So, uh, Arno, let's start with you. Uh, can you remember when was your first Mobile World Congress? Uh, and do you have any particular memories from that first visit? Oh, that's a question. Yes, it's um, quite a long time ago as a young engineer. I think it was in Cannes, perhaps the first edition in, in Cannes on the French Riviera. Uh, it should be in uh, 1996, I assume, uh, because we had the, uh, quite a unique experience uh, uh, in, in 1996. It was the first time in, in Cannes, when we had that during nine years, I think, and when we moved to, uh, to Barcelona now. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm just live from Orange Wolf in, in Barcelona right now. And it's a bit um, the same size as what we had in, <laughs> in Cannes uh, two decades ago. So it, it's, it, yes, it's a way to, to reconnect uh, this year. And I'm sure we will see uh, all of us uh, next year. Excellent. Well, yeah, coming full circle a bit, the circumstances, of course, rather different. And of course, I'm sure in 1996, if I remember rightly, everybody was just starting to get really excited about the upcoming launch in a few years of 3G. So a little bit different to where we are now. Um, so, uh, Jose, uh, when was your first Mobile World Congress uh, and what memories do you have? Yes, um, um, there's not much uh, many, many people that knows that I was event director of the Mobile World Congress uh, when we brought the Congress to Barcelona. So, uh, uh, my 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 first mobile congress was the two thousand and eight edition. Uh, that uh, we uh, the, the, that's when we brought the event from Cannes uh, to Barcelona, 
and uh, my memories are, are uh, from a person that are on, on the other side of, of the fence. So uh, the first decision was uh, to make sure that registration w were uh, doing going smoothly, that we have en enough uh, capacity to uh, cater for all the attendees and provide enough food and all of these things. So uh, good old memories. Uh, and, and those first years, I spent basically to understand whether Barcelona was the right city to uh, stay as a GSMA. And uh, I, I think we did the right choice uh, to, to keep the Congress in Barcelona. And uh, as I know mentioned as well, I'm also uh, this week in, in Barcelona. Uh, it's true that it is a little bit less attended, but uh, it, it is worth. Uh, in, in my case, and, and I've been speaking with a lot of people, it is the first time in more than one year that we have the chance to meet colleagues, uh, to meet friends, and to meet customers. And, and I think that's something that little by little we need to start recovering. Absolutely. And I think everybody will share that sentiment. And uh, interesting, you started on, on the other side of the fence there. I'm sure that was uh, quite a stressful time. But like you say, Barcelona has proven to be, I think, the optimum choice for that show. And of course, we'll all be looking forward to being back there again in early 2022. Thanks very much, Jose. Uh, Phil, what about yourself? Your first MWC and any particular memories? Yeah, I think, it was, I think it was about 10 years ago when it was in Barcelona. Um, and the one memory I have was I remember walking through the exhibition hall uh, with my boss. He was a really nice guy. He was quite short-sighted. Uh, and he bumped into someone else in the exhibition um, hall and was very apologetic about it. And then about 30 seconds after that, he realised that his wallet was missing. So actually, I think the guy had walked into him and had been a professional pickpocket and um, stolen his wallet. So that's uh, that was my lasting memory from the first one. Wow. Yes, that's. Uh, I think that that over the years that's happened to a few people. I think definitely over the years we've seen security uh, improve massively in Barcelona. But yeah, there's uh, not the best of memories for some of their their first visits there. Uh, hopefully, of course, that's never happened to you, Phil. And won't happen to any of us here again when we return to the show. Uh, Caroline, what about your first visit to a Mobile World Congress? It was 2010. It was, remember, the old FIRA in Barcelona. I remember I was uh, very ill-dressed because I was wearing high heels. And if you remember, it was actually the slope. <laughs> Unlike the new, new FIRA, which everything's flat, I was walking and... It just on the hills, it was just miserable. By the end of the day, I think I was started walking around barefoot when no one was looking. I only put on the hills with people. It was horrible. And I, I remember that night I went to, what is that? Um, the large uh, department store, uh, Cortez Inglex. I immediately bought myself a flat uh, hill. I, I just couldn't deal with the, the next day, the high heels anymore. So lessons learned. Don't wear high heels when you go to a trade show like Mobile World Congress. Absolutely. I'll make sure to remember that, Caroline. Thank you very much for the tip. And if I remember rightly, if I remember rightly, Will I Am had a few uh, problems on those cobbles as well in the shoes he was wearing <laughs> when he visited as well. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Tom, uh, any MWC memories for you? Uh, yeah, so I think probably I'm a bit of a latecomer to MWC in person. Um, my first physical presence at MWC was in 2018. Uh, I've worked uh, in the background at various companies that I've been at in the past with messaging and building technical demos and so on, but not actually been there in person. Uh, so 2018 was my first year there. And I think probably the lasting memory was just the sheer size and scale of it. Um, I was aware that it was big and there was a lot of attendees, but uh, only once you're there and you're able to take the time to move around between the different halls um, and meet a mix of customers, partners uh, and colleagues, you really get a scale uh, of the size of the event. Um, uh, my lasting memory um, actually was in 2019. Um, I happened to get a, a, an insect bite um, and uh, unfortunately, I had a, quite a bad reaction and I had to go to the emergency department in Barcelona. So um, my lasting memory of the 2019 one was actually how good 
the Spanish healthcare system was uh, as a visitor. But um, the event itself was was very, very impressive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it takes a year to to get your head around just how long it takes to get from from one place to another, from one meeting to the next. Uh, but great, you had that positive experience of, of the health system there. They're, they really are geared up for that large number of visitors. Okay, excellent. Great uh, memories there of first visits to MWC. Thanks to everybody for that. And uh, Guy, I think it's time to come to our first question of the day. Yep, thank you, Ray. Thank you, everyone. That was that was uh, highly in enjoyable. Uh, first question of the day, and Arno, I think I'm going to uh, uh, ask you this, uh, give you the opportunity to answer first here. And incidentally, I think your first three GSM World Congress was my first one as well. I'm sure it was 95, 96, one of those years. It's so far away now and so long ago, I can't exactly remember when it was or what happened, but I know it was in Cannes and it was, it was terrific. Right, first question. How far are CSPs away from a real plug and play open RAN system from multiple OEMs in the same network? Uh, good question, uh, Guy. Um, in fact, uh, when we talk about open RAN, we are talking about uh, openness, uh, cloudification and intelligence. And with openness, we have this, uh, this uh, split between uh, um, radio unit, uh, distributed unit and central unit where uh, with a frontal interface and uh, these key free uh, blocks. And of course, um, if, if you want to have this plug and play, you have to, um, to have uh, integration um, work and effort. That's why uh, um, many operators have uh, open um, uh, or run integration center to, to, to help for the, uh, the risking and for uh, the test between uh, many uh, uh, companies. Uh, of course, as Orange, we are contributing on, on that and um, uh, we have one prepared for the ne next uh, uh, Orange plug fest, uh, for example. Um, uh, another way to have a, a plug and play um, approach and to have a, a better integration is to uh, what, what we did with the other European uh, operators. We just published uh, some technical requirements um, for Europe. Um, where we operate um, and uh, to, um, to to limit the number of profiles that uh, you you will need to to to, to investigate and, and to test so you you have in uh, the orange specs quite a number of options and we wanted really to to reduce uh, this number of options to make sure that uh, all the the players and there are many of them arriving right now on open run ecosystem and that with some of them present in Mobile World Congress this year to, to, to really um, uh, have a, a better plug and play. It, it's a journey, it's not done, but uh, through this uh, Oran Integration Center, through the efforts from each individual um, uh, OEM vendor and uh, through this uh, technical requirement, uh, uh, for example, for, for Europe, I think it's a quite major step to uh, achieve at the end uh, uh, some plug and play uh, approach. Thank you, Arno. And as you say, test integration is becoming so, so important uh, with um, Open Run and uh, furthering the Open Run deployments. Any of our other guests want to, uh, to comment on, on this question of how far away we are from uh, a true plug and play Open Run environment? Uh, if not, um, I'd say I'll thank Arno for that. And uh, oh, Caroline. Yeah, I just, I just want to chime in like, um, so my uh, obviously as intel we've been participating in open RAN for quite a while also i happen to have the honor to sit on the uh, the, the tip board so we've seen a lot of these uh, progresses I, I fully agree with all of there's a lot of profiles uh, that oran alliance uh, uh, put out some of the work for example the group of five uh, operators that orange is part of they've been trying to they've been aligning in fact they just published a, a a requirement spec recently, right? Uh, in conjunction through through TIP, and the more we align on the requirements, that we better off to getting to a more of a closer to a plug and play. And in addition, some of the work that we're doing, like Plafest, Intel has hosted one, and Oran has an interoperability lab, and TIP is also in in the mix of working to get that kind of interoperability plug 
PuffFest um, together. I think the more we do that as industry, the more uh, we achieving the plug and play, which is ideal situ- ideal case. It significantly decreases the time to market, time to deployment, and and costs for everybody in, in, in the supply chain. So I, I think we'll get there uh, pretty soon. I think the word that uh, all the uh, Orange Alliance, TIP, and the group of five operators are doing uh, is a it's a great step forward. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, and it is so early days. It's what is will be a a very long journey for Open Run. Uh, Ray, let's uh, let's hand over to you and our next viewer question. Okay. Thank you, Guy. Uh, here is our next question. Uh, what can be done in radio access network the RAN to make in building coverage better for five G? Uh, so one of the big challenges for 5G to get coverage uh, in building. Uh, Phil, let's come to you first with this one. Yeah, sure. So I think um, in building coverage used to be a voice problem years ago. And obviously that saw the popular use of DAS systems, so distributed uh, antenna systems. But nowadays, I think voice coverage is less of an issue. It's more a data uh, coverage issue. And so I think what can be uh, done to help improve matters there, you know, within the HPE portfolio, we have a division called Aruba, which um, grew its kind of base products uh, in the Wi-Fi space. And so there's a lot of work that operators can do with Wi-Fi providers to use um, Wi-Fi offload to move traffic off the kind of public 5G network and uh, onto the uh, Wi-Fi networks that most companies have. Linked to that as well within the Aruba products that we also have kind of CBRS, which is the systems band radio spectrum, which is being used um, more extensively across the US now to build private 5G networks. And that again is helping improve uh, data coverage in particular for uh, enterprise customers in buildings. Okay, uh, thanks, Phil. And uh, Jose, let's come to you on this uh, in building coverage question. Yes, uh, going back uh, to what it was mentioned about uh, distributed antenna systems, uh, we see that uh, there is a, an interesting footprint already of um, solutions covering in buildings, in, in buildings, in malls, in hospitals, but also in, in uh, transport hubs, uh, hotspots, as well as uh, uh, stadiums or, or uh, pavilions. Uh, and uh, we see that um, to improve the inbuilding coverage, uh, there are different additional options. So uh, an RF repeater could be a, a solution as well uh, that could be implemented. Uh, uh, but uh, both uh, passive DAS uh, using the, the E node B or active DAS are solutions uh, that you can uh, find already implemented in the market. Uh, it's true that uh, more and more there are solutions uh, like the digital uh, DX, uh, uh, DXS. Uh, there are solutions pr- uh, provided by uh, different vendors uh, that are coming to, to place. And I, I see that uh, there's already demand uh, from uh, venue owners uh, to have 5G implemented in the, their venue. But one, one of the interesting uh, discussions that we are having, uh, for instance, in the small forum is, uh, can we define a, a different split uh, than uh, in open run uh, than a split seven or an split two uh, that can facilitate the implementation of in building coverage? And there is a very interesting discussion whether a split six uh, it could be something that uh, will uh, boost uh, the use of open run in buildings. And uh, we are working with different standardization bodies and also with uh, uh, different other associations to see. Uh, whether we can explore this open run split six as an option for in building coverage for 5G. Okay, excellent. Great. Thanks for that insight, uh, Jose. And uh, Caroline, you wanted to come in on this as well. Yeah, I, actually, I just wanted to chime in on what Phil mentioned about CBRS. So in the in the United States, a lot of the uh, cable operators actually have started that uh, discussion. There's some recent announcement. What we try to do is, uh, in, in fact, taking the 7.2 split, taking the open RAM, but 
offering that at a smaller form factor, smaller power footprint. And it's actually, it, there are uh, 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 trials and POCs going on right now, taking a small cell in the open RAN uh, split 7.2 or split 2 going into a uh, indoor in-building coverage. I think uh, what, what we have seen so far is a power footprint does meet and the, the requirements for indoor indoor coverage for especially either private networks or simply for a public network by really serving the in-building, especially around enterprise. A lot of focusing has been around the enterprise side uh, rather than home. I think home may be something that we still have to, to look at uh, whether what's the right form factor for that. But enterprise uh, factories, uh, we're seeing a lot of that 7.2 open red uh, provide well sufficient coverage at a cost and power footprint factor that's suitable. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Caroline. Um, okay, if we don't have uh, any more comments on this particular topic, then Guy, I think I'll hand back over to you for the, the next part of the program. Yep, thank you, Ray. Well, time now for our new feature, Telecom TV Uncorked which celebrates one of the pleasures of the networking hour and after show parties at MWC, such as the super panels that Caroline knows so well from uh, previous shows. Now, each day this week, we're selecting a wine from a different major region of Spain with the help of our expert, Pierre Mansour of the Wine Society. So let's see what Pierre has for us today. So my second selection is a wine called uh, Paso de Villarai. That's the name of the producer. The, um, the, the key thing here is Albarino. That's the name of the grape variety. The region that Albarino is grown in is Galicia in northwestern Spain. And uh, this, is, um, this is a really Atlantic influenced part of Spain. It's nicknamed its nickname is Green Spain uh, because it's it's quite cool, it's quite damp, it rains quite a lot, um, and so it makes wines. Um, only specific grape varieties will 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 grow and ripen successfully in this part of Spain, and one of those is Albariño. Being slightly cooler, the wines tend to be lighter, fresher. They're not big and heavy. Um, and they tend to work best with absolutely no oak. Um, so they're made really, really simply. The, the, the reason that I picked this wine is because Albarino has really spearheaded an, a, a huge revolution in, in Spanish white winemaking. And it's really down to the um, advent of, of stainless steel in wine. Um, and in, in Spain, a lot of Spain's traditional winemaking is based on using oak. Um, stainless steel um, is an inert container and with specific styles of wine can help express that brightness of fruit and Albarino is one of those. So 20, 30 years ago there really wasn't good quality Albarino on the market. Um, in the last 15 years uh, the, 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 the progress in this area has been astonishing so much so that countries around the world countries in the Southern Hemisphere, in the US and so on, are starting to grow Albarino because it's become, this has become quite a fashionable grape and, and it makes a really lovely white wine to drink on a summer's day. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely aperitif style white wine that has a sort of appley, peachy fruit character and mouth-watering and, and very refreshing. <laughs> Well, I completely agree with what Pierre has to say there. I mean, it is a beautiful wine. In fact, it, it, you know what, it, Ray, it was a Telefonica press event at MWC that first introduced me to this wine. Oh. It's absolutely fantastic. Nice nose to it. Look at that. Uh, and you know, oh, today's, actually nice. my, today's actually my 20th wedding anniversary and I'm spending it with back-to-back -back studio filming. So a quick toast to my wife, who is in the far corner of the studio producing today. Cheers. Happy anniversary, Guy. Happy anniversary, Gibson. Thank you. And yes, I can confirm 
that has got a great nose on it. Peachy. Mm. Absolutely. We'll be finishing that off later. Well, look, it, that is a great white. <laughs> well, you know, it is after 5 p.m. here in the UK, so it's officially wine time for us. Uh, and if you're not familiar with Albarino and you appreciate a glass or two of wine, then I do recommend you try it and get to know your local wine merchant, wherever you live, whichever country, a good one is of enormous help and value. And if you don't drink, that's fine. Do whatever it takes to unwind and escape the world of telecoms, at least for a little while. Phil, are you a fan of the Albarino? Certainly am. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and Caroline, I bet, I, bet, uh, I, I bet you've had a few Albrinos whilst the MWC. I, have, I, I actually have a bottle in the fridge right now. I just like, it's like 11 oh. a.m. here. It just feels wrong to drink wine. <laughs> <laughs> Never too I early. I thought about it. Never too early. I actually thought about it. <laughs> actually, I've said it's 5 p.m. in UK. But, but um, Guy, you reminded me. Remember the super panel we always have? At a Mandarin Oriental on the first day, that's usually yes. quite a party. Oh my gosh. Oh, I miss that. Oh, yes. <laughs> you can tell yes. that Memories I'm of Barcelona. Like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the next year. <laughs> anyway, moving, moving along, moving along. Um, our next question Is 5G virtual RAN more reliable than the systems already being used from the major vendors, such as, you know, the likes of Ericsson and Nokia, whoever, you know who they are, the traditional vendors. Um, and is it any cheaper in the end? Do we have any thoughts on that one? Well, perhaps, you know, Tom, perhaps I could come to you and maybe change the question around a bit and take it from a security angle and ask, ask you uh, the, the question with, uh, with an eye on security there. Yeah, sure. So, um... I think probably one of the key aspects with, with virtual RAN um, is, a, is a shift change in, in the platform architecture and the components. And embracing that IT-based uh, infrastructure and the cloud platform presents some quite different security challenges to the traditional, uh, what I would call black box approach of, of, of baked in vendor solutions. Um, now that uh, cloud platform and software driven approach adds huge amounts of flexibility it certainly benefits with things like recovery from failure uh, and recovery from a, from a health perspective across service functions. Um, but the complexities it adds in having multiple additional components uh, of different layers, uh, be it the cloud platform, the application services, uh, the network connectivity, the software driven network connectivity, um, the mean that the, the, I, I don't think you could say it's necessarily more reliable. But at the same time, I don't think you could say it's necessarily less reliable. Uh, I think the aspect is the challenges are different. And as long as the understanding, certainly from a security perspective, and when I count security, uh, I mean availability, which is a key part of being reliable, um, as long as the security considerations are paramount from the outset, I think it has every opportunity to be as reliable um, as those traditional black box approaches. Uh, good to hear. Thank you very much for that, Tom. Uh, Phil, what about this aspect of, of, of price? Um, you know, do you want to address the part of the question where we talk about, you know, is it ultimately going to be a cheaper solution for CSPs? Yeah, I think I would imagine it should be a cheaper solution. I feel more confident about that um, because I think you can combine um, different functions that right now you would see on separate pieces of infrastructure, such as a kind of front wall gateway, cell site router, uh, encryption appliances, and also enterprise applications as well. So I guess historically they would have sat on different platforms. So now what you can do is you can combine those in this VRAM world and put them all on one platform. So ultimately I think it will definitely be cheaper. On the reliability front, I think right now it's too early to tell, isn't it? Because there aren't any really big deployments out there. So it's a bit of a wait and see on the reliability side, but I definitely think it will be cheaper. Thank you very much, Phil. Caroline, have you got any thoughts about uh, about this question you can add? Yeah, I, I think that the question about cheaper, it's never, it's not just a capex, right? I think you've, ta you've talked to uh, Tarek, for example, uh, early on. They, they, when he has been very publicly talking about the, the total cost of ownership, it's not just a capex, there's a lot of OPEX, uh, the savings that we should, uh, that ORAN can, bring to us toward such as 
cloud-like management, automation. You know, the more that we look at the telco network, telecom network, like the way that cloud has been managing a lot of the automation that's built into the cloud. If we use the same principle to manage a 5G network, uh, there's definitely, we, we are seeing some of the outback savings. Uh, you know, in addition to what Phil talked about, the, the cost for CapEx, driving more software function consolidation onto the physical box. That's what ORAM brings. Uh, but in addition, uh, look at the, the the OPEX savings, the automation, what that can bring into the overall cost of ownership. I think there's definitely a huge potential for significant savings there. Great. Thank you very much, Caroline. Uh, any other comments from any of our guests on, on that question? If not, then Ray, let's go back over to you for our next viewer question. Okay, thank you, Guy. Well, here's our next question. Uh, when will there be a lot of 5G small cells deployed? And does it make sense for all operators to share small cells instead of building out their own? Um, Jose, maybe we can come to you with this one. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I think that a, a massive deployment of uh, 5G small cells uh, will come uh, when the mobile operators start uh, having a 26 gigahertz spectrum. So that's that will be the first uh, step. And once they have that spectrum, uh, also there has to be demand uh, of uh, services with a uh, high bandwidth. And we do see that that may happen in uh, city centers or hotspots. Uh, we have already implemented uh, in the next uh, nearly uh, 2,000 nodes. And we see that uh, in cities like Milano, there is an interesting demand of uh, having a small cells across the city. Also, we see in London, uh, there are 14 neighbor neighbors that, uh, and boroughs that uh, are uh, uh, starting to deploy small cells. Um, we calculate that uh, uh, for each of the macros, there might be up to 10 uh, small cells uh, that, on the optimistic uh, uh, way. And that, that implies uh, uh, tens of thousands of uh, small cells in each of the countries. And concerning the second uh, question, um, does it make sense uh, to share? Uh, we, we do see uh, uh, that it, it is the only way, uh, sharing is the only way to have a feasible model to implement uh, a small cells uh, in each of the land posts of a city. But uh, we have been talking uh, to both the mobile operators, but also the cities. And uh, there, is, uh, there is a high interest in each of the cities to have uh, uh, the implementation of a small cells structured structured in a way that uh, whenever the mobile operators are going to implement uh, the uh, small cells, they do not do in each of the lamp posts uh, and each of the lamp posts is used one, by one single mobile operator. Uh, ideally, uh, a sharing model is uh, the models that we see in the city that are the, the most preferable one. Yes, absolutely. And we're seeing a lot more infrastructure, infrastructure sharing agreements amongst the operators these days as 5G strategies evolve. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Jose. Um, if there isn't any uh, other responses to that question, then I'll hand back over to you, Guy. Oh, oh sorry, I, I Caroline. Just, I beg your pardon, Caroline. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to chime in, uh, in addition to what uh, Jose Antonio mentioned, we also seeing quite a bit of the private network interest. Uh, it's it's not like it's just a lot of private network being deployed, but we definitely see a lot of interest. Like the early trial, India has participated in several. A lot of these can be classified as small, especially the ones indoor and on prep, factories, retails, um, precision agriculture, greenhouses. There's a lot of things being wiring up uh, for five G. But right, they're starting with the EMBB, but a lot as, as we go forward to say things like URLC, maybe some of the massive uh, IoT uh, devices coming on board. I'm going to make a bold prediction that we will see a more small cell coming in, uh, even a venue 
area, maybe there will be some of the uh, sharing that um, infrastructure sharing that Jose Antonio mentioned. I, I think eventually the jury is out, but if we go into a different type of uh, deployment model, uh, one example would be some of the hot topics going on, at least here in the US is around V2X. How do we do the V2X that such that anybody who owns a car that has a has a capability of uh, coverageing, like I was just recently in Alaska, in that kind of rem, uh, more of a least less populated areas, I think the sharing uh, more small cell on the lamp posts that closer to the highway, I think that's gonna that's gonna come in play. So recently we have participated in something called roadside unit, which is nothing more than a network in a box that's hanging on the roadside uh, infrastructure uh, that we actually just announced a, a trial that's in, ahead of the Beijing Winter Olympics in conjunction with a Chinese operator to test this out. So some of these I think will be very interesting to watch at least uh, I'll propose that the Ray and Guy next time when we get together next year in Mobile Congress, we will have some of the evidence, the things that we say here, whether it's true or, or completely false. But I'm I'm more I'm on the confidence side that this is going to happen. We're going to see a lot more small cell to serve not just the data session that we browse in the network, but also serve a lot of enterprise use cases. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to put network in a box next to wine in a box uh, on the telecom <laughs> TV booth, hopefully. Uh, oh, that'd be fantastic. Okay. <laughs> uh, make sure we drink out of the right one, of course. Okay, uh, Guy, Guy, back over to you. Yeah, I was also getting very excited then because I thought Caroline was saying uh, when, we, uh, when you and I next meet up at the Winter Olympics, I thought, yes, please, thanks very much. <laughs> But never mind, <laughs> never mind, Barcelona it will be then. <laughs> anyway, we have another special feature this week. We are really spoiling you. This is your after show. Yes, and we're asking viewers to share their memories of past MWC or 3GSM events. You've heard from our guests today and hopefully you've had a chance to watch the first episodes of our Top 10 Mobile Moments series. And if not, I thoroughly recommend that you do. They're a lot of fun. Now we want to hear from you, so please send us your photos and we'll show them on air. Now we've got a selection today that go back, ooh, look at that. These are these are 3GSM World Congress shots from, from the heady days of Cannes on the Riviera there. <sighs> You know, some things don't change. Oh my word, oh my word. I'm, thank goodness that's not a tapas, that's gotta be frog's legs, surely. <laughs> some things don't need commentary, do they? <laughs> Isn't that our new employee? Or one of them is. <laughs> and most of the stands and booths are on boats. Ah, oh, now that brings back horrific memories. The show daily, <laughs> that was a lot of work. And who doesn't like the balloon man? <laughs> oh dear. That would be me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, thank you. Okay, well, thanks for sending those snaps in and please keep sending them in. If you want anonymity, we will guarantee it. Uh, back to our after show then. And uh, Ray, have you got our next viewer question? Yes, uh, thanks Guy, we do. Uh, and here is the next question, uh, and it is, is there much difference between private network RAN systems and the ones that the public mobile network operators use, or is it all the same technology? Um, so any difference between private network RAN systems and the public RAN systems? Uh, Arno, maybe we can come to you first on this one. Uh, thanks, Ray. Yes, it's a good question. In fact, you have the same building blocks when you want to do a, a private network uh, around some uh, doing some indoor coverage, for example, uh, moving to some firewall with some core network element. Of course, sometimes you, you could be done private network, just a data only, a data driven uh, network and on, on the public network, mainly via voice data uh, approach. So um, that's why as, as Orange, we, um, we are promoting quite a hybrid approach for our customer moving to a public plus private. Um, and because we have uh, 
uh, um, we, we could propose really this hybrid approach like virtual private networks on, on public network, private extension, uh, where we could uh, get the traffic out locally uh, on, on a side for, for private use cases. And, and, and there is there, uh, uh, because it's the same technologies and, 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 and the same way to, to build a, as uh, uh, an operator and integrator, we have we could provide an, a number of benefits. With uh, we, we leverage on the public network investment, uh, on on the coverage mixing, uh, mobile broadband, fixed price access, and and B two B usage. We can really uh, share the, the cost of the investment between customer doing uh, a multi site and and multi customer approach, and of course we can assure a right uh, a mobility for for the objects with. Uh, a continuity of services between sites and and between the, the the private part and 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 the public network. So yes, same, same as building blocks, of course, um, with with a way to do it to 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 simplify on on the private network, and and uh, we will see more and more package solution for for private network arriving um, from different operators or integrators. Absolutely. Great. Thanks, Arno. And uh, Jose Antonio, let's come to you next. Yes, I agree uh, with Arno. Uh, in the end, uh, uh, we have uh, similar uh, building blocks. Uh, but it's true that uh, to design a private network, um, specifically, you have uh, different considerations. You have considerations in terms of um, privacy uh, and therefore uh, all the system behind all the radio network uh, is something that uh, you, you look after carefully. Um, also, considering um, uh, different scenarios, um, uh, some of the private networks are used to uh, automize uh, factories uh, and they might need uh, faster responses. So, uh, despite uh, you might have a specific radios, uh, there are specific dedicated uh, optimal for the use of uh, private networks. Uh, the, the reality is that the technology, it, it is the same. Uh, vendors are uh, normally the same. Uh, it's true that in private networks, we see uh, the, the opportunity to start including instances from uh, other alternative vendors. And not only in open run, but for instance, in virtual EPCs, when you want to uh, do an instance of a virtual EPC, you may decide uh, to use uh, one of the alternative vendors. Uh, and also depends as well on uh, the segment. We see an exponential interest in utilities and they have some requirements more uh, related to IoT and therefore the radio may, uh, might be focusing on, on that part. Uh, there are other on manufacturing uh, and we mentioned uh, as well on, on uh, what, what is happening with latency and all of that. But uh, with logistic and transport, uh, uh, tracking is one of the things that uh, they're they're uh, looking after, and uh, with radio system together with GPS. So, in the end, uh, despite uh, there are similar uh, building blocks, uh, there are uh, industry specific partners uh, that uh, requires a specific radio access uh, features. Okay, excellent. So, uh, lots of room for differentiation here, by the sound of it. Uh, Caroline, are you seeing uh, the emergence of some of these specific uh, vertical um, uh, options for, for radio access network? Yeah, and Spectrum is definitely the first one. Uh, US sit using a lot of CBRS and Germany has their own private Spectrum. I think UK, Ofcom has some too, with Sweden and so on. So the radio seems to be, the frequency could be could be different. The second thing that we notice is the software requirements are very different. Uh, the building blocks are the same because they do tend to align with what's 3GPP and, and ORS spec. But because of different verticals have different use cases, like the factories, uh, they will have a very stringent requirements on security. And also many times the private networks need to accommodate what's already in, on the ground. Wi-Fi is typically one. Uh, SD WAN, so you see things like N3 IWF that you need to accommodate non 3GPP traffic in a 3GPP um, infrastructure. We see that quite a bit coming up. Uh, we have announced, for example, working with XOR to establish some of the uh, the private uh, industrial network. So we 
it, it, it works with the operators, but the the manageability side, the fact that the IT tend to have to approve some of the uh, rollout, so it does put a different spin on what the five uh, G network for private network is probably going to be slightly different than the public because the decision making process are different, the purchasing uh, process is also different. Um, we see uh, if it's a AR, VR, or it's what they call XRs involved, that the, um, the fact that deterministic nature of it's much more stringent because it's not just accommodating somebody's browsing network. Many times it's, it's relating to a robot, a robotic arm in, in, inside the factories. We've, we've done uh, things uh, in, in partnership with Jose Antonio's uh, company in Smart City. Again, that puts in a different different requirements and many times the players, the SI is different because the verticals are different. Uh, we recently just did one in the Snohomish Sol County in Washington State here in the United States. Partners are very different. Who shows up, what the requirements are. You're working with a local agriculture, working with a farm, a greenhouse, a vineyard. So it, it presents its own challenges. But at the same time, to us, it's, it's a it's a term expansion, right? It's market expansion for all of us in, in this world. So I think it's all net net is good. Building blocks the same, but we need to take care of a lot of manageability and software players, and also being able to accommodate a, a, a different uh, system integrators in, into this new uh, ecosystem. Okay. So definitely not a case of one size fits all here then for the radio access network. Excellent. Thank you very much for uh, all of the insights there. Uh, Guy, back over to you, because boy, look at the time. Wow. Exactly. Time is flying. We've just about got time to check our audience poll and hopefully squeeze in another question. Our audience poll this week is a little bit different to the usual poll. We're going to be deciding who wins our daily Great Tapas Taste Off. Now, if you've watched our news program, The Slice, and we hope you have, earlier today, you'll have seen Ray and me make our pitches for our favorite tapas, complete with homemade videos from our respective kitchens. And we asked you to decide on a winner. And today's choice was between Ray's calamari mm -hmm, and my boccaronis. And the winner is, reveal the poll. Oh, it's Ooh, uh, recounts maybe in order here. Ooh, ooh, Ray, I think I think your calamari has just edged my boccaronis out. That's a, a shock result of the night. Probably not the first shock result of the night, but it's a shock result of the night. Goodness me, I'm speechless. I think we'll have to. I think we'll have to take that as a final result, there, guy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Look, this is all a bit of fun and we're going to keep the polls open a bit longer. In fact, we'll keep them open all week. Uh, don't forget to tune into The Slice tomorrow around midday UK time to see our next challenge. Okay, uh, I think um, we just about have time to squeeze in that final viewer question. So, Ray, what have you got for us? Yes, thanks, Guy. Uh, so this question is, uh, who is going to test all of the new radio access options before they get to the network operators if operators use RAN technology elements from multiple suppliers? So uh, this has come back a little bit of the topic we had earlier. So uh, basically, who's going to test and make sure it all works together and that it's all secure as well? Um, so, uh, Tom, maybe come to you first on this one. Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> I think um, uh, one of the things, again, I'm going to have a bit of a security slant on, on this type of subject, but I think one of the things that's important to be considerate of is, is each of these different vendors that form part of this several solution will, yes, conform to standards and specifications on how their technologies will work, but each company, each vendor will implement their own business practices, security design uh, processes, um, and those may be in conflict with each other, and they may not in turn meet the security requirements uh, of the end customer, of the end operator. So I think it's important that the end MNO customer, the telco themselves, set a baseline uh, set of security requirements that the uh, vendors need to adhere to. And I think probably just to broaden that, the responsibility of who's going to test will likely fall to the common systems integrator. Um, I think uh, an aspect will be pushed towards the, the vendors themselves to test to a certain degree uh, of, 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 on the case of interoperability. 
uh, again, based on that that baseline that's dictated by the the customer. Um, but the systems integrator is critical critical in that in that area. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Tom. Uh, great points there. Um, okay, uh, if we don't have any other uh, comments on that question, then Guy, I'm going to uh, hand back over to you. Yeah, thank you, Ray, because. As you said earlier, we are out of time. Uh, we've run over time. We were simply having too much fun today. Thank you so much to all our guests who joined us for this live programme. And thanks to our audience for watching and sending in questions. Now, we'll be back tomorrow with another live after show programme. But before then, we have plenty more in store for you on day three of Spotlight on 5G. Yes, tomorrow's Strategy Outlook takes an in-depth look at the 5G edge with interviews and roundtable discussions. We have two further episodes of our Top 10 Moments in Mobile, where we take a look back at the best video content from 20 years of covering 3GSM and MWC. And tune in sometime around lunchtime, UK time, for The Slice, our daily news and analysis programme. And Ray and I will be back at 5 p.m. UK time for the live after show. You know, I think it's going to be another long day. For now, though, from Ray and I, thanks for watching and goodbye. The after show was recorded in front of a live online audience.